Welcome to this news event held by the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. You'll hear from the Bulletin's president and CEO, five members of the Bulletin Science and Security Board, and author and science communicator, Hank Green. Then we'll open the floor for questions from the media. The Q&A period will be for reporters only. And if you wish to ask a question, use the raise your hand function and your line will be unmuted when it's your turn to ask a question. We'd now like to introduce Dr. Rachel Bronson, President and CEO, Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. Hello, welcome to today's news event. I'd like to thank the Harris School of Public Policy at the University of Chicago for its ongoing partnership and for serving as the Bulletin's host institution. My colleagues and I join you this morning to update you on the 2022 time on the Doomsday Clock. The Science and Security Board of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists sets the doomsday clock each year to answer two important questions. Is humanity safer or at greater risk this year compared to last year? And is humanity safer or at greater risk this year compared to the 75 years we've been asking the question? The time of the doomsday clock represents the judgment of leading science and security experts about the threat to human existence with a focus on man-made threats, nuclear risk, climate change, and new disruptive technologies. We at the Bulletin believe that because humans created these threats, we can reduce them. But doing this is not easy and has never been so. It requires serious work and global engagement at all levels of society. This year marks the 75th anniversary of the Doomsday Clock, one of the most powerful pieces of graphic representation, one of the most effective pieces of science communication, and one of the best examples of the power that art and science can have when they come together in informed and collaborative ways. While the doomsday clock serves as a metaphor, the challenges it represents are very, very real. This is one reason that we're excited to have Hank Green join us as a featured guest today. Hank is one of the leading science communication communicators of our time, and in that way is in direct line of descent from Martil Langsdorf, the creator of the doomsday clock. At the Bulletin, we are recognizing the clock's 75th anniversary with innovative programming, including an art exhibit entitled Human Nature at the Weinberg Newton Gallery in Chicago, curated by Cindy Kahn, open through mid-April, a mobilization festival in New York's Times Square, organized around the sculpture Amnesia Atomica, created by the Mexican artist Pedro Reyes, on display between May 17th and 24th, the publication of a new book, The Doomsday Clock at 75, by Robert K. Elder and J.C. Gable, and a social media challenge in which we are asking people around the world to share their ideas of what can be done and what they are doing, what you are doing, to turn back the clock. To join the challenge, simply post your ideas to Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, or Twitter with the hashtag TurnBackTheClock. All of this and more can be found on our website at thebulletin.org. Since its inception, the Bulletin's Doomsday Clock has been set closer and farther away from midnight. In 2020, we set the clock the closest it has ever been to midnight, 100 seconds. It has been set as far away as 17 minutes to midnight at the end of the Cold War. The reasoning for why we set the time where we do can be found in our annual statements that accompany our announcements. We are releasing the 2022 time statement today and that can also be found at thebulletin.org. When the board set the clock last year at 100 seconds to midnight, we noted that we continue to believe that human beings can manage the dangers posed by modern technology, even in times of crisis. But if humanity is to avoid an existential catastrophe, one that would dwarf anything it has yet seen, national leaders must do a far better job of countering disinformation, heeding science, and cooperating to diminish global risks. The board went on to argue that the COVID-19 pandemic serves as a historic wake-up call, a vivid illustration that national governments and international organizations are unprepared to manage complex and dangerous challenges like those of nuclear weapons and climate change, which currently pose existential threats to humanity, or other dangers, including more virulent pandemics, and next generation warfare that could threaten civilization in the near future. This year in our statement, the Science and Security Board highlights several bright spots and many disturbing trends. 
the board describes a mixed threat environment one with positive developments counteracted by accelerating negative ones, an environment that my colleagues will further elucidate in the follow-on discussion that can be found in the statement on our website. Now, joining us from Chicago to reveal the 2022 Doomsday Clock Time are Dr. Daniel Holtz, a co-chair of the Science and Security Board and a professor at the University of Chicago in the departments of physics, astronomy and astrophysics, the Enrico Fermi Institute and the Kavli Institute for Cosmological Physics. And Dr. Suzette McKinney, a member of the Science and Security Board. She is also the principal and director of life sciences at Sterling Bay, where she oversees relationships with the scientific, academic, corporate tech and governmental sectors involved in the life sciences ecosystem. Today, the members of the Science and Security Board find the world to be no safer than it was last year at this time, and therefore have decided to set the doomsday clock at 100 seconds to midnight. The doomsday clock continues to hover dangerously, reminding us how much work need is needed to ensure a safer and healthier planet. We must continue to push the hands of the clock away from midnight. Join us by participating in our Turn Back the Clock Challenge that can be found on our website, thebulletin.org. Thank you. Before we continue, please note that a link to the Doomsday Clock report, news release, photos, and video can now be found in the chat area of your Zoom dashboard. The next speaker is Sharon Squassoni, research professor at the Institute for International Science and Technology Policy, Elliott School of International Affairs at the George Washington University, and co-chair of the Bulletin Science and Security Board. Thank you. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you're joining us from. The doomsday clock is holding steady at 100 seconds to midnight. But steady is not good news. In fact, it reflects the judgment of the board that we are stuck in a perilous moment, one that brings neither stability nor security. In 2021, there were some positive developments in each of the areas of concern that the Science and Security Board reviews. However, these have not managed to outweigh the longer term negative trends that continue to erode security. For example, the extension of the New START Treaty helpfully keeps a cap on numbers of US and Russian strategic nuclear weapons. Are we better off with the treaty? Absolutely. But it is a small down payment on strategic stability so desperately needed between the US and Russia. In the current environment, where we have neither arms race stability nor crisis stability, tensions over Ukraine loom ominously. And with China, efforts to craft a strategic stability are in their infancy. In climate change, rhetorical progress is not yet matched with swift actions. And in the sphere of biosecurity, trends point toward less rather than more cooperation to identify and manage or mitigate threats. A particularly invidious threat is the intentional undermining of the public's ability to sort out what's true from what's patently false by information warfare. This subverts our ability to arrive at consensus on the solutions needed to achieve positive change. We include at the end of our statement an illustrative list of positive actions that could make a meaningful difference. Although it's not often said, the Science and Security Board is largely optimistic about humankind's ability to use technology to mitigate existential threats, provided there is a will to work toward common, common objectives. I would now like to turn the floor over to my colleagues who serve on the Bulletin's Science and Security Board to highlight the challenges we considered when setting the 2021 time. Thank you again. That was Sharon Squassoni, research professor at the Institute for International Science and Technology Policy, Elliott School of International Affairs at the George Washington University and co-chair of the Bulletin Science and Security Board. Let's go to our next speaker, Dr. Scott D. Sagan, Caroline S. G. Monroe Professor of Political Science and senior fellow and co-director at the Center for International Security and Cooperation at Stanford University. 
I want to start by acknowledging some positive steps moving away from the brink in 2021. In February, the United States and Russia agreed to renew the New START Treaty for five years, capping the number of strategic warheads in each arsenal at 1,550. Washington and Moscow also started two sets of diplomatic dialogues about how to best maintain nuclear stability. And Presidents Putin and Biden repeated the mantra that Reagan and Gorbachev first uttered. A nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. Such statements do not automatically produce stable relations, but they at least display an awareness of the gravity of the problem. In addition, when the Biden administration began its nuclear posture review process, Secretary Blinken announced that the goal would be to reduce the role of nuclear weapons in US national security policy. And elsewhere, the Biden administration agreed to engage in talks with Iran to re-enter the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, to talk to China about strategic stability, and also to re-enter nuclear talks with North Korea. The doomsday clock is not set by good intentions, but rather by evidence of action, or in this case, inaction. Iran has not returned to the negotiations and continues to build an enriched uranium stockpile getting within weeks of having sufficient materials for a bomb. Saudi leaders have in the meantime said that if Iran goes nuclear, they will too. China has not agreed to strategic talks with the United States and North Korea has not come to the negotiation table. Signs of nuclear arms races are clear. The Chinese are constructing new ICBM silos on a large scale leading to concerns that China is considering moving away from a no first use delayed response doctrine to a launch on warning doctrine. And as Herb Lin will discuss momentarily, China and Russia have tested new anti-satellite weapons. The US, Russia, and China are all building hypersonic missiles, and the North Koreans continue to test nuclear capable short and medium range missiles, including cruise, ballistic, and glide vehicles. And they continue to produce new nuclear material for an expanding arsenal. Both India and Pakistan continue to increase their arsenals. In this fall, President Putin threatened to put nuclear armed submarines off the US coast. Russian officials warned about tactical nuclear weapons being alerted over the Ukraine crisis. And Russia's Deputy Foreign Minister, uh, Sergei Rybakov, told state television on January 13th, they could neither confirm nor exclude potential unspecified military deployments to Cuba and Venezuela. Such nuclear saber rattling is disturbing and dangerous. So with the exception of the new START agreement, the world faces multiple arms races without arms control. And the Science and Security Board will be paying close, close attention to the nuclear posture review in the hope that the Biden administration will implement its goal to reduce the role of nuclear weapons in US security policy rather than increase their role. Finally, a comment on the January 6, 2021 insurrection on the US Capitol. This was clearly an assault on democracy, but it was also a warning of the danger of internal threats to nuclear command and control. The, insurrection, the insurrectionists came close to capturing Vice President Mike Pence and the nuclear football that accompanies the vice president as the backup system for nuclear launch commands. We as a nation have too long been complacent about nuclear security because we believed our system of governance was unshakable and it was safe to have the authority to use nuclear weapons rests in the hands of one individual. It is not. So we have kept the clock so close to midnight in recognition of both external threats and internal threats to nuclear security. Thank you. Again, that was Dr. Scott D. Sagan, Caroline S.G. Munro Professor of Political Science and Senior Fellow and Co-Director at the Center for International Security and Cooperation at Stanford University. Let's proceed to our next speaker. Dr. Raymond Pierre Humbert, Halley Professor of Physics at the University of Oxford and lead author on the IPCC Third Assessment Report. Yes, hello. Each year that human activities continue to dump carbon dioxide into the atmosphere nearly irreversibly ratchets up the toll of human suffering and ecosystem destruction arising from global climate disruption. The essential measure of success in averting worsening climate catastrophes is the extent to which actions are put in place to put emissions on a track to be zeroed out within the next several decades. We've had over 40 years of warning that the climate crisis was coming. The 2021 Physics Nobel Prize, in fact, recognized that the connection between human-caused carbon dioxide emissions uh, and global warming is based on absolutely firm physics. It's a tragedy that the warning has not been acted upon sooner. 
there is no more time to waste. The year began with reasons for hope, in particular with following the election of Joe Biden to the presidency of the United States, the return of an administration there that views global warming as a real and serious problem requiring action. There was also great hope that the Glasgow Conference of Parties meeting would usher in a new era of more stringent commitments toward achieving the net zero goal. Unfortunately, the clock is ticking and actions taken are not nearly sufficient to achieve decarbonization of the world economy at the rate needed to avoid two degrees Celsius of warming, let alone one and a half degrees Celsius of warming. There was hope that in the recovery from the COVID crisis, the world could build back better and that part of that would be making progress towards decarbonization, but that has not happened to any great extent. Investment in fossil fuel production proceeds apace and far from declining, carbon dioxide emissions have resumed their growth. Political paralysis in the United States Senate has prevented the United States from taking the leadership role on climate that it needs to take. And in particular has prevented the kind of key investments needed to, de de needed to decarbonize the US economy, though there have been some improvements around the margins. The past year has seen a staggering onsla onslaught of climate disasters. We've had the heat dome, over North America, worldwide fires, drought, floods, but this is just a sample of what is to come if we don't get the emissions of carbon dioxide to zero. There have been some hopeful developments, particularly regarding commitments made in the Glasgow Conference of Parties. Many nations have made commitments to achieving net zero carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, it's progress that many nations have acknowledged the need to phase out coal, albeit on a too long time scale. Uh, there is hope that the bilateral US-China climate negotiations have, considered, have continued. But commitments mean nothing if not backed up by firm actions. The key question is whether the commitments made will be backed up by concrete actions. The situation is dire, but all is not lost. There is still time to get this boat unstuck and to get it moving toward net zero. So long as there is any fossil fuel left in the ground, there is still room to keep the climate from getting yet worse by making sure that it is left there and not dumped into the atmosphere. But the longer we delay, the worse things are going to get. Thank you. Again, that was Dr. Raymond Pierre Humbert, Halley Professor of Physics at the University of Oxford and lead author on the IPCC Third Assessment Report. Let's go to our next speaker, Dr. Asha M. George, Executive Director, Bipartisan Commission on Biodefense. COVID-19 has revealed our national and global vulnerabilities to biological events. Millions around the world continue to be infected by a disease caused by a virus we managed to ignore for 20 years. In 2002, the first cases of SARS appeared. Those initial outbreaks should have served as an adequate warning. After all, the disease was deadly and highly infectious, but we managed to control its spread and felt so comfortable that we halted research into a vaccine to treat it. As if that was not enough, we went through the same experience 10 years later in a different part of the world with MERS. We got it under control and forgot about it again. Seven years later, COVID-19 began. The notion that we will never again experience a worldwide disease event caused by SARS is utterly illogical. If we can bring an end to this pandemic soon, we should still expect another variant to arise within five to seven years. The virus continues to mutate and defy our expectations, as well as our medical countermeasures. Let me also remind you that we have yet to defeat pandemic influenza, Ebola, cholera, and a whole range of weaponized biological agents. As the world continues to focus attention and resources on responding to COVID-19, it does little to eliminate the vulnerabilities the disease exploited in the first place. Make no mistake, COVID-19 continues to exploit those vulnerabilities. Misinformation, disinformation, and to borrow from our French colleagues, non-information, continue to exacerbate our inability to defeat this virus. Leaving aside the threat from naturally occurring diseases like COVID and pandemic influenza, human-generated biological threats continue to increase. Some we have brought on ourselves, 
such as through the inappropriate and practically flagrant misuse of antibiotics, forcing microorganisms to mutate and overcome the few medical countermeasures we have. Others occur because the onerous requirements of programs to regulate high biosafety level laboratories do not adequately prevent inadvertent releases of organisms into surrounding environments, not even here in the United States. Many nation states, failed states, and terrorist organizations have also expressed interest in the advantages biological weapons afford, especially in the way of asymmetric warfare. The fact that we have active biological weapons programs in Russia and North Korea, with China and Iran close behind, should give us pause. Nearby countries and those that consider these countries to be enemies must now engage in the arena. The biological arms race has begun again at a time when our vulnerabilities are most obvious. At least 5 million people have died from COVID-19 throughout the world, with an additional estimated 30 million deaths going unreported. Thousands of laboratories work with dangerous pathogens, not just the 59 highest containment laboratories, and those are the labs that we know about. And at least four nation states now possess active biological weapons programs. We stand on the precipice of a biological cataclysm. It will take very little more from this arena to push us right over the edge. Countries throughout the world should at least strengthen their ability to monitor for infectious diseases, no matter what the source. They should assume that outbreaks that occur in other countries will not stay confined there within their borders or regions. And they must take extraordinary measures now before biological weapons programs result in bi biological warfare. We find ourselves in the worst situation possible, having to prevent and prepare for the next biological event while simultaneously responding to the current pandemic. But we can do all of these things at the same time. We, we really can. Yes, there are many deadly threats to, to the world today. And yes, our resources are limited. But we can no longer afford to focus all of our efforts on other perils to the exclusion of the biological threat. COVID has made that clear. If we do, diseases and lives they take will push the second hand on the doomsday clock closer to midnight. Thank you. Thank you again. That was Dr. Asha M. George, Executive Director, Bipartisan Commission on Biodefense. Let's go to our second to last speaker, Dr. Herb Lin, Senior Research Scholar for Cyber Policy and Security at the Center for International Security and Cooperation, and Hank J. Holland, Fellow, in Cyber Policy and Security at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. Thank you. Um, on disruptive technologies, I wanna call attention to anti-satellite weapons and digital technologies. On anti-satellite weapons, we know that Russia conducted an anti-satellite uh, test in uh, November uh, last year to destroy one of its own satellites and creating the debris cloud that uh, potentially threatened the International Space Station. Uh, earlier, uh, Russia conducted close approach space uh, operations that potentially threatened uh, all orbit satellites. Uh, in addition, in years past, the US and China and India have constructed, had conducted destructive anti-satellite uh, activities. The net result of all of this is that ASAT weapons are on the verge of becoming important elements in the military posture of many nations. Uh, since satellites provide many important civilian and military functions, the prospect that they may they become much more vulnerable during crisis does not bode well for strategic stability. On digital technologies, malign uses of digital technology have not been curbed in any significant way. Cyber attacks on important computer systems continue with pace, as demonstrated, for example, by the 2021 ransomware attack on Colonial Pipeline that disrupted fuel supplies on the U.S. East Coast. We see it also in China, Chinese use of digital surveillance technologies reaching new heights with AI and, RF and facial recognition systems being tested on the Uyghurs in uh, Xinjiang uh, and an effort to develop facial standards for facial recognition that can be used to distinguish individuals by ethnic group. And perhaps most significantly, uh, Technology-enabled disruption of the information environment has arguably gotten worse over the last year. Although the new administration has done much to depoliticize the role of science in informing public policy, 
disinformation from the outside the executive branch appears to have taken even stronger root in dangerous ways. Enabled by technology, large fractions of the Congress and the public continue to deny that Joe Biden legitimately won the presidential election in 2020. And their views on these matters appear to be hardening rather than moderating. Similar trends regarding COVID-related disinformation are apparent around the world, crippling the ability of public health authorities and medical science to achieve higher rates of vaccination and mask wearing and better social distancing. And despite the revelations uh, last year about the role of social media campaigns and taking advantage of vulnerability to human psychology and cognition to spread disinformation and societal unity, disunity, the actual behavior of social media companies has changed hardly at all. The even more alarming uh, it has been the cynical exploitation of such trends by elected officials in their quest to gain or retain political power. Rather than standing up for the rule of law and defending the conclusions of an independent judiciary regarding various allegations of election fraud, they pointed to such outcomes as yet more evidence of a system rigged against them. Technology has contributed mightily to an environment in which no conceivable evidence or rational argument can persuade true believers to change their minds. And the resulting fractures mean a world in which different and antagonistic political tribes each live with their own factual universes. This is not a world governed by reason or reality and is itself an existential threat to modern civilization as we have come to know it. Thank you again. That was Dr. Herb Lin, Senior Research Scholar for Cyber Policy and Security at the Center for International Security and Cooperation, and Hank J. Holland Fellow in Cyber Policy and Security at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. Finally, we'll now turn to our special guest speaker, Hank Green, science communicator and author. Thank you, everyone, for all of the all, all of that information. I, I'm really honored to be doing this and, and sobered by the challenges that have been presented by, by all of you here today. This is uh, the third year in a row now that the clock has remained at 100 seconds to midnight. And at first glance, that might seem like, uh, great, okay, we're at the same place we were last year, but we aren't. I mean, have you looked around? It, it feels like things have changed in this year because uh, this is not what this symbolizes. Um, I think that there have been many positive outcomes that would have moved the clock back on their own. Our understanding of COVID-19 and our capability of preventing and treating it have expanded massively. Our ability to rapidly design and manufacture vaccines is unparalleled in human history. Major car manufacturers are planning on releasing over 100 different fully electric vehicle models in the next two years. And this is a stat that kind of blew my mind. The United Kingdom emitted more carbon dioxide in 1889, not per capita as an entire country than it did in 2021. So economies can grow while emissions shrink and some governments are doing that. Other governments are pledging to do that. This is, this is nice to know that it's possible at least. Meanwhile, there are reasons to move this clock closer to midnight. There's a rising tide of nationalist and isolationist blunder, bluster that has resulted in rapid movement away from the kind of multilateral agreements that we need for weapons technologies and climate change and biotechnology and artificial intelligence. Human exposure to extreme heat has tripled since 1983. When I was three years old, the existence of vaccines has only uh, only helps people as much as people will take them. And a growing group of social media influencers masquerading as politicians and pundits have found that there is audience to be gained and influence to be gained by catering to and amplifying people's natural fears and apprehensions, tearing down reality so that they can be masters of the delusion that they construct in its place. 75 years ago, when the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists first debuted the Doomsday Clock, I doubt anybody in that room would have uh, challenged the idea that the technologies that are most disruptive to human societies are weapons technologies. But I want to challenge that idea today. The thing that makes us human, that gives us the ability to like use the secrets of the atom to destroy whole cities or use those exact same secrets to fight a cancer to save the life of a child, it's not our con like control of the atom, it's communication at the root of that. And as we have increased the amount of information we can transfer between each other quickly, 
so has our power over the world grown. And that power has allowed us to travel to the moon, to visit our grandparents in Seattle, to dramatically decrease the rate of infant mortality, to look back in time to the, to the beginning of the universe, and to watch me in my office from a thousand miles away. This is the power that allowed the universe to wake up and look at itself and then say to itself, this is beautiful. So atomic energy might seem like the greatest power we have ever harnessed, but it is not. Our greatest power has always been and will always be our words and our, our ideas and our stories. So I think the most disruptive technologies to societies are communications technologies, whether that was the printing press and Martin Luther setting off 200 years of religious wars that resulted in the deaths of tens of millions of people in Europe, or the internet requiring us to rebuild our information ecosystem from scratch. I think we need to remember that we are at the beginning of a very big shift in how humans communicate. We do not know what we are doing with this colossal new tool that we have been given. Like a monkey with a gun, wondering why this thing makes so much noise and then surprised when our foot starts bleeding. But I know a group of people who are better at handling it than anybody uh, the, or at least the demographics of the people on the screen today, it, it, people who are better at noticing the BS and, it, and it's seeing when like a scalpel is being used like a, like a sword, they are the people for whom it has always been there, young people. And if I have things to say to young people, one, thanks for being in this world at this time. Uh, but second, uh, if you put the weight of all of those problems on your shoulders alone, you will be miserable and you will burn out and you will not be useful in, in this process. So pick a focus and care about that thing, maybe two things, but definitely don't feel like a bad person when you're not doing everything because no one changes the world alone and no one doesn't change it at all. And you know what that looks like? It looks like everything. It looks like teaching and nursing and research and engineering. There isn't a field that isn't about restabilizing the world as long as you think we need to be restabilizing the world and I wanna be a part of that. Because at its core, this is about everything from caring for each other to designing power storage systems. It's about being thoughtful inside of bold action, which isn't easy, but it is possible. And I'm a little tired of hearing people say that we just need to get serious about these things, uh, fixing these problems. We're serious about fixing these problems, uh, but they are very hard. You know why we're 100 seconds to midnight? It's because having a roommate is a pain in the butt, so don't expect it to be easy to have 7 billion planet mates. We're not all gonna agree on stuff, but we still have to work together. I think that we spend a lot of time feeling mad and powerless these days, and let me suggest instead, maybe just one day a week, instead of getting mad, try getting curious. Figure out why these problems aren't getting solved and be one part of one reason it gets a little easy, easier. I'll do another one and then somebody else will do another one and together we'll get it done. Every year I spend on this planet, I am more amazed, astounded and frustrated by humans. But if there's one thing that we keep doing over and over again, it's impossible stuff. What is the first step toward doing that? You have to care. You have to be interested in it, even obsessed in it. Not all of the, not, not, not obsessed in like the bad people who are standing in your way, which is very easy to focus on them because we're people focused, because we're people. Not, not be focused in the Twitter fights and the clever quips of the influencer politicians, focused and curious about the actual problems. And the fact that you're here right now, if you're listening to these experts shout for multilateral commitments to no first use weapons policy uh, and dramatically decreased carbon emissions is proof that you do care. The fact that you know what a no first use nuclear weapons policy is, even if you didn't know that 30 minutes ago, the fact that you have the words that you have been given them and that you can imagine the story where powers with deeply conflicting interests can nonetheless agree on what Ronald Reagan said I don't agree with everything he said, but I agree that a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. And likewise, we have to say the war against the climate crisis can be won and must be fought. There's no doubt that we 
We're cursed to live in interesting times, and I'm sorry about that, but uh, thank you for living in them with me because we will not get it done without you. So on the 75th anniversary of the Doomsday Clock, the Bulletin and I are asking people to join the uh, Turn Back the Clock Challenge. This is a hashtag because social media can be used for good. We want to hear about the actions that inspire you and how we can work together to save the world. So to join the challenge, simply post your ideas on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, or Twitter with the hashtag turn back the clock hashtag turn back the clock and if you want to take another step today you could check out peace-dividend.org where people of the planet are asking for something small yet massive you'll find out about it when you get there thank you everyone i appreciate what you are all doing so much again that was hank green science communicator and author thank you hank and that takes us to the q a portion of the call if you wish to ask a question, use the raise your hand function and your line will be unmuted when it's your turn to ask a question. As a reminder, these are audio only questions. You'll not be on camera and the Q&A period is for reporters only. If you're having issues with your own audio or the raise your hand function, you may use the text-based Q&A box and we'll do our best to get to all the questions. And before we start taking questions, we'd like to remind you that a link to the Doomsday Clock report, news release, photos and video is available in the chat area of your Zoom dashboard. Alternatively, you can go to thebulletin.org to find all the materials related to today's announcements. Okay. I think we'll take our first question here. It's from Voice of America, Dong Jung Park. Please unmute your line. Hi, um, I have a question to Dr. Scott. So how do you think North Korea's nuclear and ICBM development will affect the end of the world? Um, North Korea has continued testing short range and medium range missiles. It has fortunately not restarted the testing of um, ICBMs. That's, a, that's a, something that's good. What we don't know is whether they feel that um, having tested one um, missile that could hit the United States is sufficient um, and that they think that um, we would not think that that is, is sufficient having only tested one, um, they might. Um, so I think um, what they are doing is dangerous because um, imagine the following scenario. If in, in um, even if you, think that they do not want to start a war, which I believe is true, that they do not want to start a war. Um, imagine the incident that occurred in Hawaii in 2017, where a um, individual announced that um, missiles were incoming to Hawaii uh, over the emergency warning system and said, this is not a test. People in Hawaii got really nervous. People in Washington did not, however, because we have redundant warning systems. We have professional people who said this was a mistake immediately. And we really didn't think North Korea was about to attack Hawaii. Imagine that occurs in North Korea today, that kind of incident. A, they don't have redundant warning systems. They have very primitive warning systems. B, you don't get in trouble if you make a mistake in North Korea, you can get killed. So people are not going to try to say, yeah, we made a mistake. And three, they did think we were about to attack them because we kept saying we were going to attack them. So I am very worried about the situation in North Korea, not just because of concerns about North Korean decision making, but because of the risk of an accidental or unauthorized use there. Great, right, thanks. Just to cut in, we want to make sure that reporters on the line have a chance to pose their questions. We know there are several of you. If you wish to ask a question, Use the raise your hand function and your line will be unneeded when it's your turn to ask a question. And as a reminder, uh, the Q&A period is for reporters only. If you're having issues with your audio or the raise your hand function, you can use the text-based Q&A box and we'll do our best to get to all the questions. We're not showing any questions at this time. Rachel, is it okay if I throw it over to you for some uh, to add a little bit. Great, well, thank you. Um, I think you've heard from our Science and Security Board 
and this will all be online at bulletin.org. And for additional questions and to continue the conversation, the bulletin works on these issues 24-7, 365 days a week. So check out our site where you can see the members of the Science and Security Board and their contributions to the discussion, as well as experts from around the world constantly chiming in. So with that, Max, I think I can turn it over to you and adjourn the program. Mm, thank you. And just so you all know where to get more information following today's news conference, to connect with any of the speakers you've heard from today or to get more info, contact Alex Frank, at 703-276-3264. Again, that's 703-276-3264. Putting his contact in the chat as well. A recording of this news event and the related media materials will be available online at thebulletin.org. We thank you for joining this news event held by the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. That concludes today's news event. Thank you.